Hello class, welcome back. Uh, the rest of these lectures will be recorded from the bowels of the library at Judson College in one of the basement rooms. We're going to be spending three video lectures covering the Reformation. Uh, scholars refer to this as the long century. It goes from the birth of Luther to the death of Elizabeth I. And uh, so we're going to begin with Luther. Luther was born on the 10th of November, 18, uh, 1483 the 10th of November, 1483, and he died on the 18th of February, 1546. He began his studies in law at Erfurt in 1505. On the 17th of July, uh, he, uh, 1505, he entered the Augustinian order in Erfurt. And the reason for this was he was in an electrical storm. He was riding home on horseback to his family and was in a thunderstorm a bolt of lightning struck, knocked him, knocked him off his horse. His dagger slipped and stabbed him in the leg. And he was afraid of bleeding out and dying. And he cried out, St. Anne, help me and I'll become a monk. And he lived and faithful to his word, he became a monk uh, to the dissatisfaction of his father. He was ordained a priest on the 3rd of April in 1507. He transferred to Wittenberg in 1511 and received a doctor in theology degree in 1512. One of the first things that they did when he entered uh, theological studies was they took his Bible away from him that he had been given and he was only allowed to read the Bible that was available in the university library in his spare time. He was instead handed Peter Lombard's four books of sentences to study. His teaching career involved teaching uh, biblical theology at Wittenberg beginning in 1512. He lectured on the Psalms from 1513 to 1515. He lectured on Romans from 1515 to 1516. In 1517, Luther held a disputation against scholastic theology, reputing Aristotelianism. On the 31st of October, 1517, Luther nailed his now famous 95 Theses to the church door. This was not an uncommon practice. The church door was used like a public bulletin board, and if you had an announcement, you simply nailed it onto the church door. What happened, though, was this document meant to be an in-house argument, uh, debate between uh, scholars at the university, written in Latin, was put on the door. Somebody read it realized what it contained, translated it into German, and published it. This set off a firestorm across Europe, launching the Protestant Reformation. In April of 1518, Luther was involved in a debate within the Augustinian order at Heidelberg. Luther was taken into protective custody on the 4th of May of 1521 and lived under the assumed name of Junker Jorg, uh, for the next several years. During this time, he translated the New Testament into vernacular German in 11 weeks. His teaching career was interrupted by all this until 1523. He served as the Dean of Theology faculty from 1535 to 1546. Some other aspects of Luther's life, he was excommunicated by the Pope on the 3rd of January, 1521. He was questioned before the Imperial Diet at Worms in Germany in April of 1521 and refused to recant his views. In 1524, Luther left the monastic order. He wrote prolifically and in German. On the 13th of June, 1525, he married Katharina von Bora, a former nun. From October 1st through 4th of 1529, Luther met at Marburg with Zwingli in hopes of presenting a united reformation to Europe. Their failure to agree on the Lord's Supper caused a permanent rift between the Swiss and German reformations. From November into December 1525, he wrote his probably most important theological work on the bondage of the will. And this was written in response to a work that Erasmus had been commissioned by the Pope to write on the freedom of the will. In 1534, uh, and he published this in 1534. Uh, Luther published his first complete edition of the Bible in German in 1534. Key features of Luther's theology. Uh, on, the, on the issue of faith, Luther focused on the cross of Christ as the foundation of all hope of forgiveness of sins. 
Here he labored for the doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone and said that the church stands or falls on this doctrine. To add anything to this as a necessary condition of salvation is to engage in salvation by works and strip the believer of any confidence or assurance of forgiveness of sins. Good works, Luther argued, was the result of faith, not the cause of it. On the freedom of the Christian, Luther wrote, the word of God cannot be received and cherished by any works whatever, but only by faith. Therefore, it is clear that as the soul needs only the word of God for its life and righteousness, so it is justified by faith alone and not any works. For if it could be justified by anything else, it would not need the word, and consequently it would not need faith. On the Lord's Supper, Luther's view of the Lord's Supper is commonly called consubstantiation. This term may not do real justice to Luther's concept. Luther sought to maintain the real physical presence of the incarnate Christ in the elements without affirming that the elements themselves underwent actual change while continuing to appear to be bread and wine. Real presence is the real issue here. For Luther, it was a Christological question. To say that Christ was not physically present in the elements for Luther meant denying the reality of the incarnation. With regard to grace, Luther affirmed just as strongly as did Calvin or Swingley the absolute sovereignty of God in choosing who would be saved. He based his theology of grace on the writings of Paul and St. Augustine. He found support for it in the doctrine of the bondage of the human will to sin, which makes such efficacious grace necessary for the salvation of anyone. On the Bible, Luther saw the Bible as God's inspired work. He did, he did have questions about the inclusion of certain books, but the books he was certain about, he believed to be God's written and inspired work. He rejected the Apocrypha, the book of Revelation. He denied the Pauline authorship of Hebrews, placing it after the book of James in his arrangement of the biblical books. And he called the book of James a right straw epistle. Uh, because of its emphasis on works. And he expressed regret that Revelation had ever been written because of the various millennial controversies that had sparked through the centuries, including in the period of the Reformation. The next big leader in the Lutheran movement was Philip Melanchthon. Philip Melanchthon. Uh, he was Luther's friend and a systematic theologian. Melanchthon was deeply troubled by the divide that the Reformation created in the church and sought to heal it on every side. Though greatly admired by Luther, he was always suspect for his desire to find compromise and restore unity to the church. He was accused of being a crypto-Calvinist because he altered the Augsburg Confession on the Lord's Supper in a way that would make it acceptable by either Luther or Calvin. He sought ways to reunite the Lutherans with the Roman church as well. He was the first to give systematic exposition to Lutheran doctrine. He had a high view of human free will, higher view of human free will than did Luther, and was one of the greatest Greek scholars of his day. His most enduring contribution was a comprehensive overhaul of the educational system throughout Germany, and these changes in the educational system persisted well into the 20th century. The next person we want to talk about is Ulrich Zwingli. Ulrich Zwingli lived from January 1st, 1484 to October 1531. Zwingli was killed in battle in the Second Capel War against the Catholics. Upon hearing the news, Luther was reported to have said, they that live by the sword shall die by the sword. Zwingli was educated first at Bern, then at Basel, where he was introduced to the classics and humanism. He studied in Vienna before returning to Basel to receive his bachelor's degree in 1504. In 1506, he received his master's degree. He was ordained a priest at the age of 22. He continued to study the scriptures and the Greek and Latin fathers. He embraced Erasmus's annotations on the New Testament when it was published. He became a critic of the abuses of the church. Erasmus's Greek New Testament, first published in 1516, greatly influenced his preaching, and he began to sound like an evangelical humanist rather than a scholastic Catholic. 
1518, he was appointed cathedral priest of the Grossmünster in Zurich. Of his first sermon there, his companion Heinrich Bullinger said, he praised God the Father and taught men to trust only in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, as Savior. He vehemently denounced all unbelief, superstition, and hypocrisy. Eagerly, he strove after repentance, improvement of life, and Christian love and faith. He rebuked vice, such as idleness, excesses in eating, drinking and apparel, gluttony, suppression of the poor, pensions, and wars. Zwingli was influenced by Luther's writings. His family life, Zwingli married in secret. Uh, that the marriage was kept a secret cast a cloud over his reputation as many thought that he had retained a mistress. Key religious reforms. In 1523, Zurich began holding debates on key religious topics such as fasting and Lent. The collection of tithes ended, fasting was altered, clerical celibacy was denounced, images were removed from the churches. Saint worship, transubstantiation, pilgrimages, doctrine, the doctrine of purgatory, the authority of the Pope, and monasticism were repudiated. In 1525, the Mass was abolished. The Word of God was declared supreme. Key writings of Zwingli, uh, first and foremost, on the clarity and certainty of the Word of God, which came back to haunt him in his disputations with the Anabaptists. Uh, on the Lord's Supper, which caused grief with Luther over the communion controversy. Swainley's position on the Lord's Supper is often misrepresented as merely symbolic. This isn't exactly accurate. Swainley's position was much closer to that of Calvin, who held to the spiritual presence of Christ in the meal when it was received in faith. But he did argue that the elements themselves were signs and symbols of Christ and his work of redemption. Baptists often claim to hold to Swingley's view, though they really don't know and appreciate it in its fullness. And in our next lecture, we will look at the Reformation from Luther through Elizabeth I.